This is SciBite, episode 112, for December 10th, 2013. Hi everyone and welcome to SciBite, 112 of them. This is Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, which is live on a Tuesday and fresh on a Wednesday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to take a look at typing on autopilot, more data on the 2011 Tohaku earthquake, Dying Silk, Bone Grafting, Curiosity News, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. I can't wait for it. In fact, that autopilot story uh, kind of piques my interest in particular. So why don't we jump into the news? All right, Heather, where do we start tonight? There's been a conclusive study that showed by a team of cognitive psychologists that shows that when you're typing at your computer, you don't know what your fingers are really doing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so what happened is that there is they recruited a hundred and about a hundred university students and members of the surrounding community and they did an experiment. They had all right, short typing test. Mm. So on a blank, you know, uh, and then shown a blank QWERTY keyboard. Mm-hmm. And they're like, okay, 80 seconds to write all the letters in the correct location. Mm-hmm. Go. Mm-hmm. Now during the typing test, they all did you know, 72 words a minute, 94% accuracy on typing. However, when they were just writing the letters down, they could only get like 15 letters down. Oh, interesting. Written on the keyboard. Oh, interesting. You know, now, so I've noticed well, like when I'm, I can have a conversation with somebody mm-hmm. and, and continue to type a separate sentence, uh, mm-hmm. but I could never write a separate sentence while I'm talking to somebody. Oh, goodness, no. Yeah. And have you noticed that? Yeah. Well, I, I like the part where somebody asks me how to spell a word <laughs> and I'm like, hold on. And I type it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I how to spell the word. I'm like, my fingers spell better than me. As a, as, me, a, please. as a tech support guy, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked what the, what the SSH password is to some server. And I can't tell a person until I've typed it out myself, which when I'm on the phone is kind of difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm really stuck and there's not a keyboard around, I like hold my hands out and I'm like uh, paying it, trying to figure right, out the letters like, that yeah. I'm seeing. <laughs> well, what does this well, tell like, us? I mean, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, so they were trying to figure out like why that happened because auto- autoism, that's something we've known that more than a century, it's where you do something enough times where it sort of becomes second, na- you know, autonomous. Mm, mm-hmm. So like um, tying your shoelaces, making coffee, or assembly line people, how to ride a bicycle, driving cars. These are things that you do over and over and over again so that gradually it becomes an unconscious, repetitious behavior. Almost muscle memory. Uh, sort of, yeah. In a se- I mean, yeah. it, figuratively speaking. Yeah, sort of figuratively speaking for your brain. Mm-hmm. And so it, that was kind of like the the theory is that the more you do something, the increasingly autonomous it automatic it gets. So it means that you can, you know, it allows you to think about other things like talking to someone while you're typing. But what they were looking at is that why would people not know where the letters were then? So that kind of made them confused. Like, all right, but you should just know that H is always here. You know, so I, I should remember where all the letters to my name are, except I may not specifically huh. think that way to say these are the keys. That's interesting. Now, I suppose when I think of the keyboard, you know, if if it was blank, actually, now that I, and now that I'm thinking this through, I don't think I could tell you necessarily where H was. Yeah, I mean, I can I can say that because I'm fairly familiar with the letters of my name. Right. But, sure. Sure. Yeah. But there's also I am uh, not. On the other hand. <laughs> You know, there there is an H in your name, Chris. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not too familiar with it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, I could yeah. I could absolutely, in a millisecond, I could type H. 
I would, yeah. it would take me maybe a second or two to think of where H is on the keyboard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, I mean, I've had passwords before where my brothers are like, oh, let me see, let me see. I'm like, tell you what, if you can pick it out, go for it. And I type it because that's, it's automatic where I know where it is. And they just kind of stare at the keyboard and stare at me. They're like, that wasn't fair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so from that study, they even took 24 of those typists and gave them a Dvorak keyboard. Hmm. And had them learn how to do that. Mm-hmm. And after a certain period of time, they were just as proficient on that keyboard. The same thing happened where they were only able to locate the keys about 70% of, 17% of the time, which was very comparable to the QWERTY keyboard. Now, this sort of comes to the point where we're hitting an almost an age defining line mm. for some people and some of us, we had. Typing glasses. I actually got taught on a typewriter, mm-hmm. the type where you hit it and it swings the key, swings the little arm and smacks the paper. Yeah. So, and I had to be like A S D F J A K L semicolon. I had to like remember and memorize some of the keys. Now, what they're saying is, as computers and keyboards become just sort of so ubiquitous to life, that there's a generation of people who are learning. S- to type simply by trial and error. They aren't necessarily being taught or they don't necessarily, quote, learn in a normal fashion where all the letters are. So they're just sort of remembering as they go, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. So it is kind of interesting in that fact that you can, that it can do that. Because I read this and I was like, yeah, that kind of, that's how it is. Because when I think about it, I'm like, hmm. Where are the letters? And in fact, um, for some reason, on all my keyboards, like the the J key, I wear it out almost <laughs> completely. Well, I'm left-handed, so my left hand knows exactly where it is. My right hand has to be reminded where it should be. Uh huh. And so your finger's kind of hovering there. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that figure stays there, so I can remember where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. And all my coworkers that come by, they like sit there and stare at my keyboard for a few minutes. And they're like, "Where's the L key?" And that it kind of reminded me of that. I'm like, they can't find it unless they see it. Huh. They're like, I don't see it. Where did it go? I'm like, it's right there where it normally is. These are uh, these are problems that define our day, but I believe in the future. I ah, now that you know, now that you talk about it like this, and now that I look at this keyboard, I just cannot believe this is going to be the future input of the modern computer in the next 20, 30 years. It's all going to be voice, Heather, or neural right. connections, right? Oh, no. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll be the first to tell us about it when that happens. All right. Well, any other thoughts on that story? No, not right now. All right. Well, then, uh, everybody, hold on right here, right now, because something pretty exciting is going on at the Jupiter Broadcasting HQ, and that is our limited 2014 shirt, which uh, I can't remember if we had this by the time we did last week's Sidebite or not, but it has it, it's expanded beyond a shirt. It is now a hoodie. And Heather, good news, it's also a woman's tea. It's also a tagless tea for you fellas who live in maybe a warmer climate and don't want a long sleeve shirt. So we've got a standard long sleeve shirt now. We've also got the hoodie. We've got the ladies' tea and the men's tea. And good news, uh, we were reaching for a goal of 499. We have reached 736. We've exceeded our goal, which is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you to everybody who uh, grabbed a shirt. You still have some time, though. Only four days and 21 hours remain. We won't be making this shirt again. This is the only shirt we'll be doing like this. And uh, this is to uh, sort of celebrate the end of the Jupiter Broadcasting 2013 year and help us out as we reach the end of the goal. Because we had a little bit of a... We generally would take this time, for example, to talk about our affiliate links, which were conveniently linked at the bottom of the Jupiter Broadcasting website and conveniently included in our open source extensions, however, are no longer. Uh, those things so <laughs> now we uh, have this uh, t-shirt which is over at teespring.com slash jupiter 2014 only four days left though so uh if you're about a week behind on your side by shows or more it's over it is all done but uh, thank but you everybody you're, so far you're you're up to date and you could jump in on the t-shirt hoodie action yeah. you never know you never you never know you could go now act now friends go to teespring.com slash jupiter 2014 all right, Heather, what do you uh, say maybe we do a little news bite? Let's go. Oh, here we are in the news bite, Heather. And I tell you, I feel like looking back at that earthquake back in 2011. How about you? 
Yes, the Tohaku earthquake that hit Japan. Now, a lot of people remember that specifically because of the nuclear reactor uh, that got affected as well. Mm. But some of this is that they see these kind of large earthquakes. They want to find out, kind of hone in on where it, where the epicenter was, where it started, and kind of get an idea. Because once you get a better idea of what happened, you can kind of keep an eye on, well, is that more likely to happen in the future? And mm. how can we kind of see that coming? Okay. So now researchers have sort of gone and they've uncovered the cause of it, actually sort of located where it started. They, they went on a 50-day expedition, a uh, drilling expedition using, well, expedition using the drilling vessel, uh, Chikyu. And then they, so they drilled a couple of holes in the Japan, Japan Trench in order to kind of study where the rupture was. And that, so that's a fault in the ocean where, you know, two of Earth's major tectonic plates meet up at the the surf at the b- deep beneath the surface of the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So what they saw is that deep beneath the seafloor, you have strong rocks and the movements of these plates can kind of generate a lot of elastic rebound, is what they call it. Mm. And then closer to the surface, the rocks are softer and less compressed, so they have less rebound. Well, that's what they thought. So now they're looking at this. What happened was that the displacement of the plates. It's sort of one plate moved uh, above the other or, you know, displaced them. Now, before 2011, the largest, uh, there was a tsunami in 1960 off the coast of Chile when it displaced the, you know, had a vertical shift of the sea plate of the plates by 20 meters or 60 feet. Now, this specific one was 30 to 50 meters or, you know, 90 to 150 feet. So it was much, much greater. Now, what really struck them as odd was that the fault line itself was actually very thin, less than, uh, you know, five meters, 15 feet. Hmm. What does that tell us? It it means that it's the thinnest plate boundary on earth, which was definitely sort of a, a, a new sense of, uh, worry there. Hmm. And in, in addition to that, the clay deposits that fillow, fill the the narrow fault lines itself they're extremely fine sediment which means that they're extremely slippery which means that there is less friction against those plates so they're more likely to move and be easily moved in greater you know greater distances Ah. so they kind of look and they're like okay well this was to happen in the past and it kind of also gives implications to the future that similar events are not that out of the hand to to happen. Sure. They wouldn't be surprised if similar things didn't happen again. Yeah, yeah. So it's, what it means is now they can go in and like, okay, well, learning about this and going in and seeing exactly where some trouble spots are, they can go in and say, all right, we need monitoring in these areas. In fact, there were other subduction zones uh, along the Northwest Pacific where the same type of clay is present. So you have uh, Russia, Russia's uh Kamchatka Peninsula, the Aleutian Islands. There are a number of other different places that are looking that are similar that they say, okay, well, that could actually also generate similar huge earthquakes in the fact that, you know, could pa- could cause similar tsunamis as well. Hmm. Wow. Jesus, sounds like it wasn't like, sounds like it was just a matter of time. Yeah. So it was, you know, it is a definite off put in the norm. It was so much greater than everything else. But yeah. once they started looking at it, they're like, okay, well. It's probably going to happen again, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's Jeez. not that out of hand that it actually happened. And we see the possibility of similar things happening in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely a place mm-hmm. where they're going to be yeah. most probably uh, monitoring much closer. Right. Boy, no kidding. All right, Heather. Well, why don't I bring the band? Are, are you ready? Should I? Um, yeah. Come on, guys. Come on in. Let's do the two-byte news. Let's do it. Here we go. All right, Heather, what are we talking about on the Two Byte News today? All right, something slightly different here. Coloring silk worm silk. What? Yeah, so normally coloring silk needs an enormous amount of fresh water. It gets contaminated by chemicals in the process. It requires a lot of costly treatment before factories can dump it back into the waterways and 
you know, so there's a lot of havoc when factory owners maybe try to dodge those rules. Mm. So now this new idea of what can we do if we could actually color the silkworm silk itself? So what they did was they fed some some of these uh, silkworms mulberry leaves. So gross! I'm watching yes, these guys eat that these. Been, yeah, that it, they'd uh, they treated the leaves themselves. Yeah, they treated them with fabric dyes, which are was fine for the little silkworm. Gosh, so they tested funny. seven different seven different different dyes. Now only one of them worked. Okay, uh, most of the time that. Uh, Maybe the silkworm itself got dyed, but not the silk. Sometimes the silk has a sticky covering or an exterior shell that that was the only thing colored. Mm. And so once they washed it, that kind of floated away. Oh, so they get it just right. Yeah, so there was one color. It was uh, red and actually kind of came out um, a a light pink color. (laughs) Those. But... This is really something. So they're so instead of instead of dying, they're just sort of skipping the middleman and just having the worms themselves produce the colored silk. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So so they're hoping that since they've got one to work, they'll be able to figure out, okay, well, how can we get you know other colors to possibly go in? That just it sounds like we're going to lead to uh, mutant worms who will then take over the world, Heather. That's all I'm saying. I just want to warn you about that. When you start feeding them uh-huh. these weird things, then they get superpowers, and then they it's- time travel, and then next thing you know, they're trying to take over the world. Science is confused and possibly sad. <laughs> All right. Well, should we get science back on track by talking about a little bit of bone grafting? Yes. So scientists have now discovered a way to sort of refine sea coral, the properties of it, so that it's more compatible with natural bones. Hmm. Now, when you have a bone graft and there has to be something external sort of used to give a scaffolding to your bones as they heal, a lot of those, some of those biomaterials don't biodegrade completely. Okay. And those can actually cause ongoing problems so Mm. that you have, because it kind of causes things to have different properties then and densities. So you can actually cause refractures or can, in worst case scenarios, it can cause, uh, a source for bacterial growth and infection in the bone itself. So scientists were looking and they were trying to get around the, that by studying calcium carbonate that's found on the exoskeletons of sea coral. Mm. They, they were able to convert it into what they call coralline hydroxypatate. And so then they refined that into, you know, calcium carbonate. And they went through this whole process of saying, okay, now let's apply a thin layer of this on there and it gives you a strong porous sub structure that could actually be successful but still contain huh. enough biodegradable properties that it could support the natural bone healing and yet uh, degrade enough that it wouldn't affect the the bone as you're healing itself. Ooh, is this something they're ready to roll out on like a wide scale? Not quite yet. They are because there's several million people worldwide a year that undergo bone grafting. Yeah, I so imagine. they're not quite at they're not quite at that level yet, but they are looking, and it's kind of providing some important steps towards the kind of material biodegradable material that could be used okay. worldwide. Okay, hmm. that's interesting. You know, the corals figured out a long time ago. They can't argue with the corals, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, SciBite two thousand here is telling me that we either are going to rip open the space-time continuum and merge our current universe with the mirror universe, or or it's time for a spacecraft update. Oh! oh Turns out it's the spacecraft update. So uh, what Didn't is our update? I tell you to put those buttons far, far apart. I can't help it. It's an old model. It's, it budgets, Heather. Budgets. Okay. <laughs> so what's the spacecraft update this week? China's U-2 lunar la- lander. We talked about it uh, last week, and it's has actually successfully entered lunar orbit on Friday, December the 6th. And it's sort of, it's got a lunar lander on it that's ready to, it'll make a descent. And if everything goes right, it should land on December the 14th. Wow. You know, fire its landing lasers, get on there. And somebody in the chat room asked last week, or you were asking how close it was to Apollo 11. Yeah. They will be 
uh, landing in the Bay of Rainbows, which if you imagine the moon, looking at the moon, it's in the upper left-hand portion of where you see the moon. And the, the Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility, right. which is sort of the mid to upper right okay. uh, face so of the moon. Okay, so not by it. No, definitely not next to it. I didn't think it would be, but it is fairly far away from it, so. Okay, all right, that's cool. That's cool. I just wanted some pictures, Heather. I just want some pictures, that's all. Okay. I'm just asking, Heather. I'm just asking. Uh, so uh, that's the 14th, which will be, uh, bu- 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 as we're recording this, it'll be Saturday. Yes. So we'll probably have a little update next week in the show. How how cool is that? Can't wait to hear about that. All right, well, while we're up in space, should we do a curiosity update? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Oh, Oh, yeah. So uh, what's going on with Curiosity? All right. It's Laser that has frightened so many curses (laughs) throughout Sci-Bite history. It's actually hit 100. (laughs) It's Laser. (laughs) It has hit 100,000 shots. Wow. So at the start of December, actually, they actually come out and said, yep, it would hit 102,000. So it had done more than 420 rock and soil samples. They had taken, you know, 1,600 images. And the 100,000th was about 13 feet away or a little over four meters. Hmm. But on the more, that was sort of the, the laser news. But on the more important fact, they had a sort of a news conference announcing a number of things about habitable uh locations on mars what so yeah so we'd seen months ago that curiosity already said seen habitable you know land where they said yes here was water that was probably habitable and actually again they have discovered an ancient martian lake that had all the right chemical ingredients that it would have been able to sustain microbial life Mm. and this lake would have been you know 30 miles long three miles wide and it could have lasted for tens of thousands of years. And it actually much later than we had ever thought. So not as long ago. And had a longer period of time. So there would be a longer period of time for uh, microbes to get there. And so the lake itself may not have been there consistently, but it went on and off. Hmm. But the groundwater would have still been there. So hmm. it would still have been able to support uh, microbes called uh, chemoautotropes, which they live by breaking down rocks and minerals. They're kind of the things that are dear uh, down in the bottom of the ocean near uh, hydrothermal vents. Hmm. So where there's not sunlight, they can eat, you know, get their energy from doing that. Yeah. They also saw that the the Gale Crater that they're in, they were looking at the weathering pattern on the rim, and that actually suggests that there wasn't a lot of weathering where they thought it should be. And so they thought that maybe the area was actually very cold when the lake existed. And so it was completely possible that a layer of ice would have been either permanent or occasionally covering this lake. Now, that wouldn't have affected the cumulative audiotropes, uh, those microbes. It wouldn't have affected them because they're uh, perfectly happy at the bottom of the ocean. near are just warm enough hmm. to not freeze. Hmm. So it wouldn't have affected them at all. But now we're looking at a long-term lake that may have had some ice on the the cover of it. Now, they have discovered so many locations that they see are friendly to life in this area. Now, while they're still going to be kind of keeping an eye on it, they're actually shifting the mission focus itself. So they're going to be from searching for habitable environments to searching specifically for organic molecules. Oh, Hmm. That those are the, they see this whole area that they've seen over these few months. They've, they've seen all sorts of evidence saying that there was sort of an alluvial basin where there was lakes and rivers throughout this whole crater area. So like, okay, it was obviously a lot of area where there was water friendly to life, to microbes. So let's switch it over and say, let's see if we can find the organic molecules themselves. So the building blocks to life as we know it, essentially. Yeah. And they've been able to find ways to increase the chances of finding the organics um, 
that are preserved in these rock layers. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of learning as they go like, well, actually we can do this and there's a, with this specific instrument and it gives us a pretty good outcome. So they're switching over to that and they're going to be, you know, dedicating themselves to a subset of habitable environments where it's habitable and it also has organic uh, carbons. Hmm. So it's sort of narrowing down the area of say, okay, well, yes, all of this was friendly to life. Now where in that area are those building blocks are those right. those key long ingredients. Chain carbons yeah. that could have actually said, yes, this actually had all the, the stuff in the soup well, to make a, life. That's actually pretty exciting. I can't wait to hear more. Uh, and good. Now that they focus it on the area, they should. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, Heather, oh, yeah. we'll jump in the uh, time machine. Let's uh, jump. Oh, here we go. It's feeling real groovy, man. It's getting rad over here. That's right. This week, the time machine gives us a nice gentle ride to just 51 years ago, December 14th, 1962. Heather, what happened 51 years ago this week in science? The Mariner 2 Venus mission. The U.S. space probe Mariner 2 was actually appro- was able to approach within 34,000 kilometers or a little over 21,000 miles of Venus. And it transmitted the first time information about this planet. They were... You know, they had launched in August of night of August of 1962, and it finally got to December, where it was sending us back information, and it was sending saying, "Hey, this is actually a very hot, mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere," mm. saying that the temperature was, you know, 500 C, 900 F, and for the first time, they were able to kind of use the spacecraft solar wind experiment to sort of measure the density, the velocity, the composition, the various variation over time of solar wind as they went there. But they were and they were able to see that Venus does not have a strong magnetic field or radiation belts at all. Wow! So Venus has sort of been a a mystery planet, sort of our sister planet. That you know, as time gone by, they saw it was covered in covered in clouds. And early science are like, well, you, you know, maybe there's stuff under there, and it's just really hot, and hmm. it's just a bit dense cloud cover, but no. Mariner 2 was kind of teaching us that no, those temperatures and the highly, highly carbon dioxide atmosphere and all of the the things that we're looking at tell us a much different story and give us much more information. Well, really for me, it gives me, I mean, just incredible perspective. 51 years ago where they're still figuring out solar winds and doing experiments on solar winds and all those kinds of things. It really is kind of incredible what a uh, amazing amount of hyper information we have been in. Uh, for yeah. the last 50, 70 years. It's just incredible. And uh, it's only picking up. All right, Heather, should I recalibrate the side by 2000? That way we can look up into the sky this week? Indeed. On Friday, December the 15th, starting about 9 to 10 p.m. local, there's actually going to be the Geminid meteor shower. It should be at its peak about from 9 to 10 until all the way till dawn on Saturday morning. Ooh. Now, the best viewing time is going to be just after the moon set, wherever you are. Okay. Now, it's it's kind of arguing with uh, the meteor shower. So the moon is going to be sort of washing out a lot of the shower itself. Gosh, but moon. after the moon sets, you might be able to catch some of the shower itself. Okay. In general, this week, on the planet scale, Venus is still our evening star, rising after dusk in the southwest. And it won't set till more than you know an hour after dark. Mars is the midnight owl rising at 1 a.m. local time, going high to the sky, southern skies by dawn. Jupiter, another favorite planet around Hey-o. here, is uh, after dark. It rises in the east to northeast, and it's got two of the main constellation stars for Gemini, Castor and Pollux, down to its left. Mm. And Saturn is still back with us again at dawn, low to the southeast, far to the lower left of the moon. You might be able to start seeing it. So remember, the two most likely things you're going to see is Venus in the evenings over near the setting sun. And after the sun sets, turn around to the east to northeast, and you'll be able to see Jupiter. Right on. And of course, if you see some shooting stars, well, that's the meteor shower Heather told you about. And you can find information about that. It's going to be on Friday. So go check the show notes. She's got all listed right there. Oh, yeah. 
That's gonna be an that's gonna be a busy sky when you consider a media shower is going on. I'm looking and some yeah. Jupiter and Mars action. Well, yeah. I gotta tell you, this is one of our better skies in a while. And Saturn. And Saturn. Yeah. Dang. Yep. Well, very good, Heather. <laughs> Anything else we want to cover uh, in this week's episode of Sidebite? Yes, next week will actually be our last Sidebite of the year. We're gonna be taking a two week vacation during the holidays. Right. And of course, you can always stay up to date on all of that kind of stuff. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. We'll always try to keep that up to date when we're shooting live episodes and whatnot. The best way to stay up to date on SciBite and when you can give it, when you can grab it is just by subscribing to the RSS feed. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click on episode 112 of SciBite. Right below the download links, we've got the RSS feed. You subscribe and then you just get every single new episode every week. Heather, have a great week, okay? You too. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Sidebite. Please feel free to get a hold of us. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link and send us in some feedback. And we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>